This is the Tame Aperture Podcast. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Welcome to the Tame Aperture Podcast, where we talk all things movies from first time directors, indie films, art house, and much, much more. Today on the podcast, we continue 2020 Horror Month with the creative and unlikely mashup from director Toby Hooper and producer Steven Spielberg and their 1982 paranormal thriller. Yes, we are talking none other than Poltergeist. Strange and creepy happenings beset an average California family when ghosts commune with them through the television set. Initially friendly and playful, the spirits turn unexpectedly menacing, and when daughter Carol Ann goes missing, Steve and Diane turn to a parapsychologist and eventually an exorcist to help get her back from the beast. I'm Gabe Bienendahl, filmmaker, film instructor, and movie enthusiast, and I'm joined by none other than the incomparable horror fanatic veteran podcaster editor, Mr. Alan Martindale. Alan, how the hell are you? It's horror month. I'm always good in horror month. All October, t- man. You got your t-shirt on. I got my, my horror business misfits t-shirts on. I got the monsters behind me. If you're watching on, the, on YouTube. I got a. I thought the evil clown, the giant six foot evil clown that I have in my house, I thought it'd be pretty appropriate for this film. That's a uh, eerily similar. It looks like the older brother to the clown in this film. You know what it looks? It almost looks like the one I haven't seen the remake, but it almost looks like the the clown. The photos I've seen from the clown in the remake. Let's not talk about the remake because I did see. I actually here's the deal about the remake. This will make everybody laugh. Walked out of the theater. You walked out of the of the Poltergeist remake. Walked out of the theater after paying thirteen dollars. <laughs> you just That's weren't how, having it. It takes a lot for me to walk out of a movie. I know I've walked out of a movie at some point. I just cannot think of when I would have. Yeah, I, I bounced. I was like, okay, thanks a lot, guys. Even Sam Rockwell can't save you here. Oh, is Sam Rockwell in it? Yeah. Huh. Damn, and man. He's great. He's great in everything. I mean, we've talked about him. He's great. He's fantastic. He, he even he couldn't save it, Alan. Even he. That's couldn't. bad. That's that's a bad movie. But this one, on the other hand, I definitely would not walk out of. Okay. Okay. I, uh, I I'm just gonna say, I think, I think a lot of people are gonna disagree with me on this one. Ooh, I like where we're. This going. is. Uh, I'm just gonna. We'll start it off with this, and then we'll 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 dive more into it, but. I think nostalgia is is carrying a heavy load on this one for a lot of people. I really do. First off, what do you think? I don't think so. See, I'm 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 going to be put a lens of uh pure cinematic exploration and and journeymanship. In other words, I'm just going to look at it as a filmmaker and story and I think it's still there. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. As a movie, I think it's good. The writing holds up. It does. I think there is elements of nostalgia and there are pieces where I think you can get uh, sentimental. But ultimately, uh, I like what I'm watching here. I'm still amazed that it's a PG rating. Not because I mean, it came out in 82, so I understand why. But I don't I think it'd be PG 13 if it came out today. I think it would. Uh, there's only really one scene that I can think of that would bump it up to PG-13. But yeah, if if they got rid of the face, the guy picking off his face, I think okay. then it's it's a safe PG. But other, I mean, you throw that in there and it's... See, that's when it started to get interesting. And that's when I, I was like, okay. Scene. I'm surprised. You, I love that scene. See, I guess I should I should uh, kind of preface this. I have seen this movie, but it, is, it has been... A very long time. Obviously, I know all the tropes, like all the all the the one liners and the famous scenes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I have not seen it for a very, very long time. I think I was a kid probably when I saw this. 
Yeah, I haven't actually watched this. It's literally been probably 20 years. I remember seeing Poltergeist 2 much uh, more more recently, but it, I haven't watched this movie for 20 years. I've never seen any of the sequels. I think they have three or four of them. Yeah, yeah, they do. And here's the here's the other thing I want to jump into before we walk through some of the film is what's the uh, initial reaction to... So for, we have Toby Hooper, who's just getting in some way or another, he's two for two on our horror month this, this year. He is, uh, except not, he... Not, I mean, look, he, it's a legacy producing credit, but in some way he's touching a movie and everything we've talked about so far. Yeah, uh, Texas Chainsaw Remake. He was definitely he's credited as a producer and obviously that's a legacy credit, but... Uh, I, I, yeah, he did not direct this movie though. That's the thing. He's credited. He's the credited director, but Steven Spielberg directed this movie. And I will dare anybody to watch this and tell me this is not a Spielberg movie through and through. No, it's definitely uh, under the watchful eye, I will say, of Spielberg. He, well, he, I mean, he straight up directed it. Like people were, people, and I've heard, I've heard multiple reasons for it. So the, the exact reasoning behind it is not is not sure. Some people say that he was afraid there was going to be a director strike. Some people say that he was under contract for E.T., so he couldn't actually technically direct this. That's what I read. And some people say that he just couldn't help himself, that he was just on set and he just like he just lives and breathes film and he just couldn't help himself. So uh, I, I don't I know. A mixture of two and three. I can see that too. Uh, the director strike one did make a whole lot of sense to me, but from what I have I, to do my film history research and see if there indeed was a director strike happening in 1980, 81. And I'm not sure there was, but from what I read, and who knows about this source? I think it was bloodydisgusting.com or something. It was one of those those websites dedicated to horror. They had said that there was one looming, or there was you know a, a potential for a director strike. So. Uh, I don't know why that would. Uh, I don't. I don't know why he would decide not to direct then, uh, if they weren't in the midst of a strike. So I, I don't know what the reason is. But there, I mean, he absolutely directed this this film. And from what I read, he he let Toby like take over some some things, almost kind of as a just throw him a bone. But Toby Hooper was really. He, I mean, I don't see his fingerprints at all on this. I, I mean, I've seen a bunch of Toby Hooper movies, and this does not feel like anything close to what I've seen. Well, for me, there is a couple elements that I do see of his in there, but I would I would agree with you. And I think that uh, it's it'd be an interesting I, I tried to do more research, but it'd be interesting to find more of what kind of dispute went down. The thing was, uh, you had said something there was a, I, there was a clause in his contract that he could because he was making E.T. Right. This this feels yeah. like ET. This is this is ET. This is uh, a little bit of uh, you, you see a little bit of Raiders of the Lost Ark in there. Like this is a very Spielberg movie. This is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Like this is just that's what I kept thinking the whole time. I'm just like this is just a a mainstream Spielberg summer movie. Yeah, but it's not. Oh, I totally think it is. It it's not because. It, I'm not saying that's not, there's not truth to that. Um, I can't think though of another Spielberg movie. Like he, he does attempt here to go much deeper than his other films. And what I mean by that is like, uh, he, he, he does travel down a little more dark path uh, than some of his previous stuff. Third close encounters of the third kind is 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 very to, that movie is is well made and his craftsmanship is there but it's it's really vanilla it's really plain i i'm not even for considering it to be an extraterrestrial type movie it's i i i never loved that movie uh, I feel the same way. And I feel the same way with a lot of Spielberg, actually. And I know that's a very, very unpopular opinion, especially with film buffs. But and that's I think that's kind of why I felt this way about this movie. It's a good movie. Like like you just said, everything you said about Close Encounters, that's kind of how I feel about Poltergeist. It's 
It's well made. I think oh, the this right- one was way more engaging for me though than 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 Close Encounters. I was way more engaged here. Yeah, Close Encounters is 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 I don't want to say slow, but it's kind of slow. Oh, it is. It's it's slow. It, it takes it, it kind of drones there's on for a, a while. In, not to get off track. There's a scene in Close Encounters where uh Richard Dreyfus, that's who it was. Um is trying to figure out the uh the Wyoming chimney rock or whatever it's called and he's building the he, his this thing's he's building the clay mountain out of clay and he's like going nuts he's throwing stuff from the yard in his wife thinks he's gone crazy that whole scene from the beginning of it to the point where he actually sees it on TV in the news report of it is like 10 minutes <laughs> which is like way too long I'm like it's true. It's, it's it's true what you say. It's super slow. And for me, I didn't get that with this particular film. But I, I think it's partly because I was engaged from the beginning. Because one thing that Spielberg does do good in, in, in the beginning of almost every movie, for me at least, is I do get captivated because there's something silly with kids. And always. Like, always. But I loved it. Because when the dude... First off, the opening scene of this movie is a guy on a bmx bike with a case of beer riding down the street and and kids rolling up their rc cars next to him crossing in front of him he spills and beer cans go all over and he runs inside to go to the football game i don't understand the point of this i don't i don't know why he was riding his bike with the can of beer but it it was i loved it i thought it was funny well i yeah, it's it's fun, you know, and that's that's fine for if we're talking ET, you know, like and maybe this is my problem with it is this this didn't feel like a horror movie. This felt like Ghostbusters to me. Like there's nothing like no, there's nothing scary about Poltergeist. I was not I mean, and I think there's got to be one element of a horror movie that you have to at least have some sort of semblance of and that's that's it's got to be scary at some point and to me that there this was there's nothing scary they show too much uh the score is is it's a good score it's quality but it's not meant for this kind of movie it felt like et it felt like ghostbusters like it was whimsical and like when you're supposed to be scared it's playing like this fun like fantasy music and i don't i just didn't understand yeah so and, you're and basically not interested at all. No, I'm. Not, I mean, I'm not. Like, if if I was going into this just thinking like it was a, uh, a f- like a movie like Ghostbusters, like I understand that it's not it's not straight up horror, then then I'm probably more interested. But the problem is this movie is so well loved, and and so well regarded. And I was reading the reviews and people were like, this is really scary. I'm really terrified. And then I watch I it. We'll get into the ratings because it's not as high as you think. I thought it was higher than I than I expected. I it mean, to be. it's it's not that it's low by any means, but this is not a highly regarded right. like ET ninety eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Right, so. right. Well, I mean, I'm looking at at uh, Fangoria their website, and they're saying it's the scariest movie ever. And like it, Fangoria says the scariest movie. And, ever. and honestly, I don't know if it was Fangoria. It was one of those websites. I looked at a lot of websites trying to trying to understand why this is so well loved as as among horror fans. Because to I me, I love. But see, I I like the this is good, uh, and partly why I like it as well as last week we were, no we had talked a few weeks ago about uh, building characters that you're engaged in. And the characters for me, a lot of the times, a big por- part of watching the movie is like either sympathizing or empathizing or understanding the characters. And what I like about here is like, I definitely get the vibe of like the family dynamic and the beginning opening scene to me after the dude spills the beer and comes in. First off, it's funny that the dads are playing remote tag next to the neighbor <laughs> because it's 1982 and you can be on the same frequency. Is it, that's so wild to me. <laughs> it's, you know, 40 years ago. Um, that was funny. But the, the subsequent scene where uh, the mom's cleaning the daughter's bedroom and then Tweety, the, the bird dies. Right. Right. Which is, which is a setup 
for for everything about to happen because you're talking about death and burial and then in some form of paranormal resurrection so to speak but uh, I love that scene because it was just a little girl all sad that her parent, her bird died. I love that. And then the build up to the end of that, when she was all sad and then she goes, can I get goldfish now? And then hard cut to her laying and in a front hard of a kid, cut to her feeding the goldfish. <laughs> but but the, like the brothers out there, the older sisters out there, the older sisters like, Oh my, what is this shit? And the older brothers like can we, when it, uh, when it, when we, when e buzz uh, digs it up, can we look at the bones? Like, I just liked the family dynamic. So immediately for me, at least I'm interested in what's happening with the characters. So I, and it, and it's those, to me, in a good movie, like it's the little subtle things that don't seem important that help build that dynamic and chemistry. So I was, I was interested in the family, like whatever happens to the family or the kid. And this Carol Ann, by the way, is what a, for me, I, I thought she was great. I thought she was super believable. There's something to like follow her. So if you're going to have a kid take you through a story, I thought her acting was phenomenal. Yeah, she's the cutest little kid I've seen in a movie in a very long time. Like just adorable from the get go. I no, man, hey man, I agree with you. I think that I think the uh, the strongest points of the whole film are, are the family segments when they're interacting with each other, without a doubt. Uh, I, and to me, I, that's what Spielberg does great. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to approach this film as if it was credited to Spielberg for directing it. Because as far as I'm concerned, he, this, is his, this is his movie. I mean, he wrote it. He produced it. He obviously directed it. So I'm just going to approach it as, as, as this is his movie. Um, You're taking Toby right out of the equation. I am. I mean, I hate to do it. Maybe it's just because I, I have such reverence for Texas Chainsaw that I, I – I just don't understand how any one director could make these two films. Like it doesn't make sense to me. But uh, Spielberg is really good well, with let's that. Let's take a look at let's before we get into the story. What else did Hooper direct? We know he's famous, most 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 famous for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He, right? he directed Part Two as well, which is a much different movie, and I, I like what he did with that because. He didn't. Okay, so he did change it up. I mean, it's definitely different tonally. It's not the same movie as tech, the, the first one. Right. The tone of two is is very campy. It's very campy. I mean, he, he, I, and the way I, my. Yeah, but one to me is not campy. No, not at all. And, and that's kind of the, the point. I think here's my impression of, of, and this is just kind of a theory. I don't know. I haven't read about it. But from what I can gather from watching part one and part two, is that he made part one and everyone wanted him to make part two super bad. Um, and so finally, I think it was, I want to say it was like 12 to 15 years later, he finally makes it, but he knows he's not going to be able to top it. He knows he's not going to be able to, to make anyone happy. So he just goes crazy with it. He goes horror comedy. It's a straight up comedy, you know, and it's got Bill Mosley in it and he's hilarious. And you know, the, our, our original national treasure, Dennis Hopper's in it as a crazy yes, yes. revenge uh, driven sheriff. And it's fantastic. It's so campy and dumb and terrible. And I like that he was able to do that. And to me, it just doesn't at all feel, uh, it doesn't feel the same. And I'm trying, I'm looking at what else he, he has done. He's done a lot well, of he TV. He definitely does not do another film of this. And I don't mean uh, quality, but I mean scope. Yeah. I, I yes, exactly. Uh, this is a huge movie. Lots of studio money. I think it's okay to say quality because this is, I mean, this is an ab absolute quality film. Like it's, it's a studio film and it's, you know it's, what he does as a follow-up to Poltergeist though, Billy Idol's music video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's peaked at that point. And so that's his peak. That's his peak project right there. He did a lot of TV. He did the Freddy's nightmares or he did at least a few of those. Uh, yeah, he did Masters of Horror too. He did two Tales of those. From the Crypt, which I Tales remember. From the Crypt. Do you remember Tales from the Crypt? Oh, that show is fantastic. Oh, it's great. I keep the hearing Crypt. rumors they're bringing it back. I don't know if it's actually going to happen or not. Dude, I don't. You don't even get me into Freddy's Nightmares because that shit scared me. Dude, when I was a kid, that scared the hell out of me. They had a very short-lived Friday the Thirteenth series too that scared the hell out of me. I don't remember that as well. I do remember Freddy Nightmares, and I was petrified. <laughs> 
Well, you were already traumatized. Well, I already had. Yeah, last <laughs> Halloween, four months, we talked about it, and and that was uh, those were those were spooky, man. Um, and you don't get that. So here's the thing: like even watching that TV series or something like that, there's some creepiness to it, and you, there's some eerie chills that you get. So for me, a good horror film is always going to kind of give you a chill, and I can see where you're coming from. I don't know that this film as highly uh, produced as it is, has that to it necessarily. And they tried to throw in some shock value to try to create that. But in terms of the Spielberg hat or the hat of, I think just real solid in, for lack of a better word, like clean narrative storytelling, it's, it's good yeah. from that perspective. No, no doubt. And I, that obviously we all know very well that Spielberg excels at doing that kind of thing and telling a story and, and presenting a story. And, and I think they did it fantastic. Uh, it's just not scary. I mean, the poltergeist that you and I encountered in the old studio was scarier than the movie oh, poltergeist. Wow. That's right. We need to pull that audio clip up and play it right insert here. You know what? I think I have it. Let me see. I don't know if I assume. <clears throat> Dude, uh, that was. I assume you'll was... be able to hear this. Let's see. Uh... There was a. They said something. So in our, let's, in our games, in our headset. Let's uh, let's let's give a little background for this. So we were it was super late, it and we were uh, recording one of the like three hour podcasts that we had. It was probably The Shining or something. I think like it that. was The Shining. It may have been The Shining, and it was super late, and we kind of had to keep taking breaks, and we kept just talking about how oh man we're just so tired, like it's, like I'm dragging. We got to get through it. We can do it, you know. But we're 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 totally dragging and then we hear this voice and tell me if you can hear this everybody else go watch being john malkovich what was that could you hear that no it's hard okay. to come through okay you uh, could hear it on your end yeah though. i could so it was and i'm gonna say insert clip here i know you okay. can hear it. i have the raw vi file yeah it. it was being john malkovich that was the uh and it was right yeah. at the end of the thing so to me that was spookier than anything in this movie yeah uh that I think the essence of this story is spooky, which is, or I should say the foundation of it, which is the concept, which we should talk about is the concept of like uh, a development company coming in and building over the, a former cemetery. One thing I was confused on, is this an Indian burial ground or is it just a regular cemetery? I think it's just a regular cemetery. I always kind of, grew up believing that this was a movie about an Indian burial ground, but obviously I don't think it is. I could have sworn that they say that when there's that scene where they take um, the, the dad uh, and, and his boss tries to upsell him and they're talking about expanding to the next phase of the development. Yep. And the boss says, Oh, we've done it once before. Cause he's saying, if we expand to phase five, we got to move the cemetery. And he's like, well, that sounds like a sacrilegious thing to do. And then he goes, well, we've done it before. This time, at least it's not an Indian burial ground. I could have sworn he said he that. did. He mentioned Indian burial ground. And I'm sure people listening have seen this movie way more than us. But from the way I understood it was he said, at least it's not an Indian burial ground. But I That's could be wrong. That's what I thought, too. But I thought he was talking about the, the new phase they were going to have to remove the cemetery. See, and that's what I thought, too, and still, until all the, the corpses started popping up. And they, they didn't look yeah, like an Indian burial ground. With tuxedos on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, that's... Well, someone needs to clarify for us on that. I always thought it was an Indian burial ground, which always has the tie-in to, like, pet cemetery. Because you're like, oh, well, that's a pet cemetery still. Right, right. Right, because in Pet Cemetery, it's isn't it an Indian burial I think ground? So yeah, the animals back to life. Yep. So, uh, I digress. Anybody who watches the film, pay attention to that. See if you can clarify for us if he mentions that they actually uh, built houses over the Indian burial ground, or it was just a normal cemetery. Because at the end, you're going to be confused when the skeletons pop up, <laughs> unless we're just stereotyping, Alan. Well, I mean, when you when you say Indian burial ground, you think like an ancient. Uh, you know, a tribe. You don't think of like a modern day, you know, Native American cemetery. You th you think of an absolute, you know, way back in the day. Yeah. 
type of we thing. Like oyster bead necklaces. And yeah. Like dresses. You the don't traditional type of thing. That's what you think of. You don't think of modern day, you know, right. people. Right. So uh, anyway, the family, funny family dynamic. We don't need to get into every scene, uh, but uh, you know you liked that scene when they put the kids to bed and the mom was smoking a joint. That I mean, it's funny. It's it's funny. It's it's weird. Come on, it's, it's funny. weird. It, no, it is. Uh, it's funny, and I like it. And the dad, I mean, Craig T. Nelson, he's great, isn't he? Great though. I go back like and it? I don't know. Like I, I I don't. I look. I watch his performance, and I'm like, yeah, it's good. But it's also, is it? Like I'm not seeing anything that really stands out. That that. You know, like even when we watched the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Arlie Ermey, we looked at that and we were like, as, you know, as much as you didn't like that movie, you could look at his performance and say, damn, like that's a good performance. And I just didn't get I'm getting I mean, it just feels like I'm watching coach. Yeah, he's for those listening. Craig T. Nelson is coach. He's also the voice of Mr. Incredible in The Incredible. Oh, that's right. He is. So that's that's why I think he fits this role so well, because he's got the american dad down pat, yeah yeah i think well and he, he's what he's reading a book about reagan i mean this is this movie is kind of about capitalism to an extent well we'll have to get into that because yeah. i have some questions about your your because there's some thematic things going on definitely there so uh expound on that why do you say that uh well first of all i mean they kind of beat you over the head with it when he's reading the book about about Ronald Reagan. Okay, but maybe he's just reading a book about Reagan economics. Maybe. I mean, it could be. But then the whole the whole theme of putting profit ahead of what's moral in regards to the uh, the cemetery. And, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's kind of, and it's the American dream. He's living the American dream. He's got, you know, 2.5 kids. He's got a dog. He's got a nice house. Uh, but there's something dark hiding underneath all of it. Right. So to me, maybe not about capitalism uh, necessarily, but about the America. I can see that. That's good. Um, all right. So one thing I neglected to mention was I, I mentioned the first scene is actually the um, the dad on, with carrying the the beer on the bike, which isn't true because before you get into a full credit roll, it's the uh, opening scene, which is the introduction to the paranormal activity with the TV screen buzzing, the daughter waking up, going downstairs. And again, I, I mean, to, to talk about the America thing, we hear the national anthem playing as, as, and I understand that was a common thing when TV stations would go off the air for the night, but it just kind of hammers at home. But that's the opening scene. It goes through, dad and mom are in bed smoking a joint. The kids are scared. I loved the cut though. I thought it was so funny when the boy comes in, the son, and he's, and he's, uh, telling his parents that he's scared because he's seeing the moving, the shifting of the tree in the window. And the tree is a bit clunky. I get it. Um, but when he goes into the bedroom and then he, they, uh, his dad goes back to him and tells him how to count down the thunder and the lightning to try to dist distract him and kind of get his mind off of the spookiness of everything. And, and then it, and then it, uh, it cuts back and, the next the next scene is the two kids in the bed with the parents i'm like that's exactly yeah, how yeah, it is yeah like you went into their room to like try to distract them and then they it appears as though it works and then within a, a snap of fingers they're both in bed with you again parents know parents it's basically <laughs> how it comes but i will say here's the one thing to me that's creepy and it's not even that i'm a overtly i'm not even crazily creeped out by clowns but that clown doll was creepy yeah, the design on the on the clown was done was very well done. Because I can see why that kid's shitting his pants. Why? First off, can we say why in the heck? And I was I was keeping it clean because this is a PG. <laughs> I, because it's a PG movie, I'm going to do a PG podcast. Um, and they say shit in this movie many times, many times, uh, which I love. I think it's hilarious. But uh, why? The the question is. Why is that clown in their bedroom? I don't know. He that the kid tries to cover it up. He like grabs a little jacket or a coat. It's freaking him out. I so can understand tries, why. I can I can too. Amongst all the cool paraphernalia that's floating around in there, there's like, did you notice all the odes to like 
Star Wars. Yeah, they really beat you over the head with the Star Wars references. There's the sheets are in Empire Strikes Back. There's a poster with Darth Vader. I loved it because that's, you know, that's my jam. But well, it, it, it was to the point where it almost felt like product placement. Oh, it was. It and was. That's George a, Lucas being like calling up his buddy Spielberg and just being like, the, hey, man. It was a total, hey, buddy, let me get you here on yeah, this one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, George knew. He knew from the get-go, man. He knew how to monetize that. Dude, George is a smart man. I'm, yeah. We won't get on a tangent, but I will give him all the props in the world for being a smart dude. Absolutely. Um, But that clown is creepy, so my question is, why is it in there? Because let's get rid of that thing. Plot device. <laughs> That's about it. It does come into play later. It does. In the scariest scene in the entire movie, I think. That, see, this is what, I, I mean, of all the scenes, that one scared me. Yeah. And it's not even so much that I'm a clown crazy, like I said. Are, are you that, afraid of clowns? Not really. Not overly. I don't understand the fear of clowns. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I talk about this with Jess all the time. Creepy. She's creep. Jess is creeped out by him. And I know a lot of people are really scared of clowns. I, I don't understand the fear of them. I, I can see why, but I think we talked about this last year, which is funny, which Probably. is like, I usually, well, I mean, for, in terms of being scared, like I usually roll at a pretty low heart rate. I'm not really in, in I'm like uh, the boy who left home to find out about the shivers. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, like, you can't, you can't, there was a, do you remember this? I don't know if you remember, there's an old TV show called fairy tale theater. Yes. You remember fairy yes, tale theater I do. With Shelley Duvall. Yep. And there was an episode called The Boy Who Left Home to Find Out About the Shivers. That's me. He goes to a haunted house, a haunted castle. Ghosts come alive. They can't scare him. He starts hanging out with them and like chilling. And But that's kind of how I am most of the time. I can't get too unnerved, mostly. Uh, so, yeah, well, I'm, I'm kind of the same. I was talking, actually, again, talking to Jess about this. She's been listening, you know, because it's getting... As we're recording this, we're we're approaching October, and so you know we love Halloween in this house. Yeah. It's like our it's our thing, and she so she's been listening to, to scary podcasts and and watching like ghost shows and stuff like that, and so she's spooked. Like she's walking down the hallway and she's jumping at, at anything, and I can't get scared anymore, and it's such a bummer. Like there's nothing. I haven't found something that scared me in a very long time. It, well, we gotta fi- we gotta fix that. I, I know. I gotta find something. I was hoping this would do it because it, the, the the poster of the girl in front of the TV is it's one of the most iconic, most well done poster movie posters I've ever seen. It's a fantastic uh, design and advertisement. And I know you can't see it, but I have it on the on the TV, like behind me. It's super creepy and it's very well done. And so I was, and people talking this movie up, and I was hoping this was going to do it. Well, we get our first glimpse because after the kids go back to the parents' bedrooms because they're scared, the clown freaks them out, the tree freaks them out. It's a big storm coming in, which is all symbolic. You have this big thunderstorm coming in. They end up back in the parents' bedroom. Once again, we get a static on the television. Carol Ann, the daughter, walks up while in the parents' room, static television. This is where we get our first glimpse of a poltergeist, though, because she reaches into the TV and a, like a hand comes out, like a kind of long fingered skeleton hand. I'm Warren's sure that I'm, I'm sure that was scary back in the day. She wasn't scared, though. Carol Ann just went with it. She follows the the uh, the, the, the ghost up and around the parents bed, right, because it comes out of the TV and then it goes in like bust through their wall with it shakes the whole house almost like an earthquake carolyn has not screamed once no. she's having a good time so she just found some new friends that's all yeah but dude if i ever woke up in the middle of the night and my five-year-old kid or whatever is staring at the tv talking to it staring at static on the tv talking to it i i think i'm running out of the house i'm grabbing them and i'm running out of the house because that would be scary as hell. Oh, yeah. I mean, the 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 realness of it, like when we heard our little poltergeist on the mic, that was so real, it scared, I almost ran out of the studio. I still don't know what it is to this day. That was spooky. 
But Carolyn's a, a tough little cookie. She's like, oh, I'm good. Because this is where, and I messed, this is where she actually says too, she says they're here. She turns around to them, to her parents, and she says they're here. And then the next day, uh, just once again, back into like the normal life, everybody's good, right? Having breakfast, nice little family moment. The contractors are outside. They're going to build a pool. So they're digging in the backyard. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll let you get to it. Well, that's what I was going to say is uh, because this is where we get another glimpse of the poltergeist. It's very soft up to this point. That's what I think. It's mm-hmm. They see like the the mom, all the kids go to school. Caroline stays home with the mom. Boom. Chairs stacked up on the kitchen table. Which Adam. would, would <coughs> I mean... At, at that point, I don't know how anyone is even still in the house. Like it's, if I, again, if I walked around the corner and I saw all my chairs stacked up and the only person there is my little girl and two seconds ago, they were all like, you know, pushed in under the table. I'm, I'm grabbing her and I'm getting the hell out of there, man. You got to save your family. She's curious about it, which is strange. She's super curious because by the time her husband comes home, uh, she's running outside to grab him and say, come check this out. Right. Because now what they've done is set up little markers on the floor and, and they can literally, uh, it's not teleporting, but it's being, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're being here? dragged or, or pushed or something. Pushed or, or dragged by some external force that's just sliding them across the floor and they're loving life. They're having a good old time. Can I, can I say one thing? I mean, it was funny when Carol Ann had her uh, football helmet on. Like that was yeah, cool. yeah. That was it's well. I mean, she's just adorable as it is. But how old is that older daughter? In the story, in the film, she's sixteen. She's I don't know 16. how old the actual actress is. But. Okay. Uh, and when the pool guys are ogling oh, before, her when, when she's going to school before yes. all this stuff happens that we're talking about and the pool guys are ogling her and i mean these are grown men and the the mom like they know these guys because they work for her husband yeah and she just laughs it off as if it's it's the funniest thing she's ever seen oh yeah they're hitting on her they're hitting on a 16 year old a child yeah and then later the on later like- on the 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 girl uh, says to the mom that she she knows about the hotel or out on route seven or something like that implying that she's been there with some dude at some point so like this is pretty creepy man like steven spielberg i mean do we need to check his history because we know we know hollywood is is, is got a bad his track record of uh of stuff like this so i just want to make sure well, that because that's to me that's 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 like not even toe in the line that's way crossing the line I mean, I thought it was uh, what I wasn't even I didn't even look at it that way, because the way I looked at it was like, why didn't the mom um, go out and just chew these dudes out? That's yeah, what I wanted I, to have. Go out and say you're fired. You're like you're yeah. fired immediately. Get like hell out of my back. It's one thing when they're kind of sneaking in the kitchen and getting food and sneaking some some coffee like that's that's something you can laugh off, you know, yeah. but like ogling your 16 year old daughter. That's when I'm coming out swinging. That's what I mean. That's where I was upset. Was yeah. like, okay, let's get the. I, I would be so ticked off, dude. Dude, I, I I couldn't be held responsible for my actions at that point if if that were to happen. And at this point, they're sliding chairs across. Anyway, back in the kitchen, they're sliding chairs across because there's some paranormal activity happening. Carolyn's had enough. She's yawning. She's like, I'm done. I'm over it. Her mom's like cheering, like this is amazing, and then telling the dad to do it. And as the storm approaches, just mosquito, they go to the neighbor's house because they want to figure out if they're experiencing any weird mm-hmm. activity. What's the, with the mosquitoes? I don't know. It's never mentioned again, is it? Because they go to the neighbor's house and while they're outside, they're just getting lit up by mosquitoes. And I don't, I, I don't understand. Like I don't, is there some parallel that I'm, there's got to be something. There's got to be something, right? Are we missing that? If we're missing that, whoever's listening, tell us what the mosquitoes mean. Because it, does, yeah, I, I I was wondering that too. I thought it was going to come into play later, and it never does. I mean, does it just have to do with? I don't know. That's a stretch. I don't even want to go. Yeah. So, 
Um, but they go to the neighbor's house, see if there's any weird activity there. While they're there, they're just getting chewed up by mosquitoes. They go back home. And then this is where real things start pumping in terms of action, right? Because up to now, there's just been some happenstance and we talked about the chairs and but now the storm has arrived and in the kid's bedroom the tree that was that's sitting outside comes alive this is alan's favorite part i get a feeling this is when it lost me like i was intrigued before i was like okay let's see where this is going this is where it lost me and it took me a long time it took a long time to get me back (laughs) because to me that's not scary it's not it doesn't even look remotely real it's not like the way the tree moves is so lumbering and slow that I'm having a hard time believing that this kid couldn't just jump off the bed and run. Well, he's wrapped up, Alan. Don't don't no. hate on it. Do you see how slow that thing comes through his window? Like it is it, it feels like a giant tree trying to attack someone. It takes him, throws him in the backyard, basically, like or has him in the backyard. The scene though, this is I think it was a cool scene. The tree was definitely a bit clunky. But the scene where the intercutting happens with him outside in the tree getting sucked into the tree and then in the bedroom, Carol Ann, uh, the closet opens, big lights come in. I liked all the stuff getting sucked into the closet. I thought that was cool. Yeah, I agree. You know what I mean? The, the, even the clown gets sucked in <laughs> and like it, literally every piece of belonging and furniture and Carol Ann's, Carol Ann's hanging onto the bed and, uh, and then it sucks her into the closet. I thought that that part was really good. And then at this time, the kids in the tree, the parents are running around the house trying to figure out where everybody is. They can't find Carol Ann. She's gone. Yeah, uh, that's every parent's worst nightmare. Worst nightmare. I mean, and- what do you do? Because you're ru- they're running around the house trying to find some trace of her and she's just gone. Which, which this is where, I mean, from that perspective, psychologically, whether it's scary in the movie or not, as a parent, you're like, this is so out. This is crazy. Yeah. This ha- and then all of a sudden gone, not just like outside. We can't find her in a closet. They're searching under beds, closets, showers everywhere. No, no kid in sight. That's where from a parental ex- side, you're getting freaked out. Yeah, it, that's that that's scary. That's that is my worst nightmare. Absolutely. And this is where I think he did a good job. Uh, and we'll just say Spielberg because that's Alan's <laughs> consensus. It's definitely it. Spielberg um, is. But I think they do a good job here where they go back to the closet and underneath. I like this. I like this a lot where under there's a body under a blanket or what appears to be a body in the closet under a blanket. And they're afraid to pull it off because it's just dead still. Mm-hmm. And then they pull it off and it's that damn clown. I knew it was going to be the clown. The whole, like, it didn't fool me for a second. And I, I love And it. I'm not it's a smart not, man. It, I wasn't, it, it wasn't about being fooled. It, was, it wasn't like some quick witted element of surprise. It was just, uh, I liked it. I thought it was fun. It was a good concept yeah. story wise. It's cool to be like, oh, yeah, it wasn't something I agree with you. I didn't get overly fooled by it. I wasn't like, oh, Carolyn's okay. dead. Okay. Because the acting the was just over the top when they're when they're trying to is a little melodramatic. Because like they keep going back to this clown, and I liked the clown. So I thought that was a good scene. And at this point, Carolyn's Carolyn's basically disappeared. <laughs> um, and they go to a parapsychologist. Well, so they don't go anywhere to authorities or anywhere. Which is very strange because you get the sense that a lot of time has passed. And I, I don't think a lot of time has passed, but they kind of the way the way Craig T. Nelson talks about how, oh, we don't go in the room anymore. We don't go in that room anymore. Yeah. It implies that a lot of time has passed, but I don't I think it's probably been a day or two is my guess. Um, but yeah, no, no authorities at all. It's just a parapsychologist. I thought they did a, I thought Craig T. Nelson did a really good job here. This is where I thought he really excelled because he just looked disheveled and he looked like a father in distress. Yeah. Go to the parapsychologist. She's, she's a, a, a professor who's got years of experience in paranormal activity. She's got two henchmen, two guys that are her, her buddies that I don't know what they do other than set up equipment, but um <laughs> they go to the house and set up all these cameras and equipment 
and they're trying to figure it out. This is where, once again, we get a little bit of paranormal activity. You love this. I already know. You can already, I mean, you can already tell, this you already your, know the parts I'm going to love and hate. This was Alan's favorite part, everybody, where the parapsychologist comes to the house, they set up the cameras, and then, uh, what, well, right before the part I want to talk about, there is one part that I'm curious if you liked, where one of the parapsychologist's assistants is in the kitchen. And yeah. he, first off, he's just really making himself at home. Yeah. That was the thing I was pissed about. I was like, dude, you don't live there. You should open people's pantry. He's going to cook up a whole meal for himself in there. Dude, he pulled out a T-bone steak. <laughs> Raw. And then he pulled a pan out. He's like, I'll just cook this up. Like, I, I love how he throws the raw T-bone right on the counter, too. Like, not, yeah. not no plate, no paper He's towel. Done. Just right on the counter. Yeah, right on the counter. <laughs> Let me uh, find a, a pan for this. And then the T-bone starts moving. And then it starts basically exploding different. It's like it's 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 protruding meat, right? Just coming out. I, I like this part. Like, I thought this was really cool. I was when it was kind of bubbling up. It kind of reminded me of Alien uh, when when the the, the xenomorph is going to pop out of the guy's stomach. Yeah. And uh, the gut buster. And so I was kind of hoping I knew it wouldn't happen. I was kind of hoping for a little meat monster to pop out of there. It was pretty disgusting, actually. It was really disgusting. And he dropped something else on the ground, too. Well, while he's going to cook a T-bone, he also is eating a chicken wing. <laughs> and it, he throws the chicken wing on the ground. And when he looks at it again, there's maggots coming out of it. Very then, cool. I, th this, this is a little creepy. I like this part. And then next thing you know, he's not feeling well. So he goes to the side bathroom in the kitchen. And he's ready to throw up. And then lights start shimmering, uh, start changing colors. And then his face starts melting off. Well, he was kind of peeling it off, or wasn't peeling he? Peeling it off. Yeah. And he kept. Well, it's, it's getting kind of melt, but he's peeling. You're right. And he keeps going. And, and that was the thing, like, because I didn't realize that this was a, a hallucination at first. So I'm, I was just thinking, why is he still peeling his face off? Just stop doing it. Uh, but it, it gets all the way down to like the skeleton. It, it's really cool. It's a really cool practical effect. Yeah, I thought so for 82, especially. And those are always fun ones where the effects, I mean, they look, of course, the authenticity is not entirely there. Right. But it's also cool enough to make it passable. And that's, uh, I liked it. I thought it was funny, but then it, it cuts out of that lights flicker and boom, it's a, he's hallucinating. He's been tricked by some some poltergeist very freddy krueger-esque very very 80s horror in that yeah. regard this is where i can see okay so St spielberg's directing and then uh these are scenes where toby hooper's like let's just up the ante more we, just, we gotta do something here this movie sucks need, <laughs> you know he was on set and he's like i need more maggots <laughs> Like go more maggots. We need more. We need more. Um, but that was a fun scene. I thought that was cool. There's a little bit of homage to some different type. It felt very 80s horror, and I like yeah. that. Have you uh have you ever seen Insidious? I haven't watched it. But when I pull up Poltergeist, it's one of the recommended films uh, along Poltergeist. It's um it's good. It's it's really good. I think uh if you like Pol Poltergeist, it's like a scarier version of Poltergeist. Uh, it's really good. It, in a lot of ways, that movie is making a lot more sense to me now because uh, Lynn Shea, who is in Insidious, she's fantastic in it. She is a parapsychologist coming to help this family at their house. And she also has like two goons or two, you know, little henchmen with her. And yeah. so I think that I, now that I'm seeing Poltergeist, I'm guessing that that is probably a little bit of an homage to, to Poltergeist. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen Insidious. Uh, it looks good, or Insidious. It looks good. It is good. It, it's as far as ghost movies go. It's 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 one of the better ones for sure. So I have to check that out. But after his hallucination, he runs into the family room where everybody's camped out. No one's sleeping in bedrooms, of course. No one's gone back into Carol Ann's room. Everyone's nervous and scared. They got cameras set up everywhere. This was the part I was alluding to that has to be your favorite part which is 
the ghostly figure that comes down the stairs. I mean, it's Ghostbusters, man. Like, it's just, that's what I kept thinking the whole time. It's like Ghostbusters have better effects than this. It, well, it is pre-Ghostbusters. It is, but not by years. not by a lot. A couple years. Ghostbusters, years. what, 87? 85? 85. 85. So it's, it's, it's three years. But here's what the question is. First off, uh, the main, I call it the beast because the exorcist later calls it the beast. But the main ghost comes down and then there's like haloed angel ghost things. What are those? Are, I, those? I'm assuming those are the people who are buried there. Who are buried. First off, everyone is super not scared. No, um, no. Everybody's, uh, I mean, there's some horror not in the sense that they're nervous, but they're not like running out of the house scared. They're like, this is in some essence, they're like, this is beautiful. And I, I kind of it kind of makes sense because Dr. Lesh, I think is is the name of the um the parapsychologist. She's kind of I I think ha, I really like her character a lot. I think she's fantastic and I think her I think she did very a good Very sympathetic as a character. Yeah, too. very. I think she um uh did a pretty good job of ex- kind of explaining that these these are just people who don't know they're dead type of thing. And so yeah. I I think that's probably that, I assume that's why they're not running out of the house terrified. But let's let's pull it out of the movie world for a second. If you saw that in your house, let's talk literally saw this come to fruition. I'm running out the door. Oh yeah. If any of these things that have happened so far have happened happened to me, I, I I'm not ever stepping foot back in that place. I'm burning it with all my belongings. The other thing to that is you're so scared you physically can't move yes like those are the spectrums either i don't know how i'd respond when i was little if you had a i mean i remember being little having a bad dream well we'll bring up freddy krueger again because i watched it when i was six seven but if i had a bad dream there were times when you woke up like you physically felt like you couldn't you know sure you're so scared so those are the only two spectrums it's either you run out the house or you're so in awe or so scared you can't move. They almost seem like they're in awe, though. They're not even scared. Yeah, it, it, it seems like a beautiful thing to them. I would be, yeah, I'd be more on the other side of that. I don't know that I'd be in awe. I think I'd be absolutely petrified. Yeah. <laughs> if you saw Where I dozens of ghosts just walking down your stairs towards you. <laughs> think of... Uh, Ghostbusters, when like they see the the ghost in the library, like for a moment there, they're so scared they don't move. Right. Yep. They're like frozen. And then it cuts to them running out of the library, but that's how I'd be. See, but they ran. So they were, they were, those were the two things. They were scared. They couldn't move. They froze and then they they ran. Yeah. They froze. And Uh, and so I wasn't sure how to interpret this because I thought it almost feels uh, non-threatening. So the ghosts don't seem like they're out to even though they of course the daughter's in some intermediary world like the ghosts don't seem threatening right yeah and that that was part of part of my problem with this being a horror movie is i i the entire time i'm being told that everything's fine like it's just you you're put at ease and whether it's th- these peaceful ghosts or the score which is like like adventure music it's not at all scary. Then it's just not. It doesn't feel like a horror movie to me. The only so once they present the ghosts and the parapsychologist is there, and they can't figure things out, and they're just absolutely trying to go to their last leg. The 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 part where it changes a little bit for me is when the exorcist comes, uh, because I thought her character was fun, man. I oh, like she's her great. Character. She's great. Uh, uh, Zelda, what's her name? Zelda Rubenstein. She is the character itself as it is, is good, but her acting's great too. Yeah. Uh, I think the character's name is Tangina. Yeah, I believe so. And she's great. And she, because for me, at least now she gives some threatening perspective of the ghost. She tells, she, and it's done through dialogue and exposition, but whatever. And it basically just, she tells you what they are, who they are, where they're going and why they're trying to get there or why they can't get there. And I, I liked her monologue too. Like every time she's speaking, I I was very engaged. 
yeah, this is where I think once like some of the look, uh, whether it's the type of writing that you like, I think the writing is well done. Right. And this is a moment where I liked all of her explanatory monologue about where the, you know, the presence and the terrible place they're in and they can't move on that kind of thing. And one of them has like rage and betrayal. And she's like, that makes it more threatening to me. Um, because now I'm getting a little perspective about who these things are a little bit. And I like, I like that she calls it the beast. That's what, yeah. In the intro, I read the yeah. beast because that's the one thing that stood out was she calls it the beast. It's and finally we'll be, menacing. Finally. It's finally menacing based on her, uh, her uh, description, I think. So uh, I also liked this. There, there was a real interesting moment where she starts talking directly to the mom and talking about how the mom has to be the one to help her. And she's going through like, you know, you have to, there's no one, no other voice that your daughter will listen to. And like, she's getting into that. And, and I liked that too, you know, uh, the motherly daughter kind of a relationship, but she's basically doing all this in preparation to take him up to the bedroom to try to get rid of the beast and also try to re recover, uh, Carol in. Yeah, it's uh, she she instantly has command over the situation. She instantly knows what needs to happen. And I think if you're a family and your daughter's missing somewhere in the astral plane around your house, I think that's going to be a, a huge relief. But I even like the little bickering that they that they kind of do when she's trying to she she's got a mission. She just wants to get Carol Ann back. That's it. That's what she's there to do. And she's trying to figure out, you know, which which of the parents is the child most most scared of. And so and I like that there's a little bickering going on, you know, between the family. Like, I just think Spielberg did such a great job where you feel that that family dynamic, even when it's not the focus of the attention. Yeah, because she says to the mom, hey, you need to call for your daughter. And then the daughter isn't responding. And, the, and then the, the, the exorcist says, Who's the one that, that disciplines and the dad steps in? He's like, I don't, he starts arguing with it. Like, that's ever, not fair. <laughs> I never spank him. That's not fair. And so then he's like, uh, so there is that little bit of, uh, and even the exorcist says like, fight about it later. Right, if right. Figure it out later. Just have the dad kind of yell at her so that like tells her to be cross with her and say, hey, uh, you know, listen to your mom. You know, answer us. It, it's just a. It was just a cool little moment that he just is really. You really f get the sense that this is a family. You know, like that's kind of. I mean, this isn't a realistic situation, but you can kind of see something like that happening. I, I just I like that he's always kind of thinking about the characters as he's writing. Yeah, and this is like you said, it's a little bit of that Spielberg touch when it comes to that because I think that's where he uh, excels most of the time in what he does. No doubt. But, uh, they're also uh, devising a plan and the plan is uh, there's some kind of portal between the worlds and somehow it goes through the closet and down to the living room above the ceiling. They get tennis balls and they write on them and they throw the tennis balls in and there's one of the parapsychologists uh, cronies down there seeing if he can catch it. It works. In other words, the tennis ball teleports from the closet to the downstairs family room. And I like how the tennis balls have goop on them when they come out. That was cool. Yeah, I like that. That was cool. It's easy to be like, let's just have it teleport through. But yeah, it kind of heightened the, the, the realness of that world, which is cool. So they throw those in and then they go into the room. And this is where like, this is where it all goes down, at least for the moment. Yeah, it's, it's cool. And uh, I, I even like the idea of... Uh, Zelda is is the actor's name. Uh, God, what is her name? Tang Tang Tangina. Tangina. I like, you know, she's going to go into the closet. She's going to tie herself up, and she's going to go into the closet to go get Carol Ann. And the mom's like, well, she won't come to you. And I like the little interaction there. She's like, but you've never done this before. Yeah. Well, neither of you. Okay, you're right. You should go. You know, like, <laughs> you it. it's, it's just, I, I, it's just fun. It was a fun little moment at a very intense uh, point in the film. And when the mom goes in to get her and then the dad's holding the rope on one end, this is where there's also a physical representation of the beast. And it's this big skeleton head 
that comes out of the closet. I, your I thought that was pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. I thought it was pretty cool. It was a practical effect, so it looked better. It was. Uh, I wasn't expecting it. It wasn't really scary, but it was pretty cool. Yeah, it wasn't like it was overly terrifying, but I thought the way it was cut as well, like with the close-ups cut to the dad screaming. He's like, oh, he's, he's petrified. And then it cuts back to the special effect. I thought it was cool. He lets go of the rope. And then when he lets go of the rope, they pull it on the other end. And sure enough, the mom and Carol Ann come through the portal in goop, just covered. Yeah. And get him in the bathtub for some reason. I don't know why. Except for I hated. There's, when you watch this again, I know you won't, but whoever's watching this, after they come through and the dad, uh, there's a shot of the dad. It's this master shot that's looking up the stairs. And one of the cronies is like, they're back and they're covered in goop. And it shows the dad run to the top of the stairs. And then he like pauses. Like he looks down. It looks so, for lack of a better way to describe it, it looks so theatrical. Like there's another one later on too that does the exact same thing. But it feels like it's something you would see on stage at a play. Right. Because they really have to sell his they have reaction. To sell the shock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in the master shot, he like pauses at the top of the stairs. And then in his, in his, I just, Oh my goodness. And then he like runs down. It just made me laugh. Um, There's another one later on that, that was even worse for me. They basically have prepped out a tub for them a wa- to clean. Like they've come through goops all over. They throw them in the tub, I guess, to warm them up or do something. And uh, they come back. They, they come out of this, this sleep. That scene was long, by the way. Yeah, it was. Only because I didn't need Carol Ann to take 10 years to wake up. Well, and, and you know, that little girl, whoever played her, was having a hard time <laughs> keeping her eyes closed. You could see her kind of moving, and and there it was even a, so. a shot where she even opened her eyes a little bit that they didn't yeah. cut around. So, I mean, it, yeah, it, it took a little bit. You see the eyelids moving. Well, and but then Craig I, T. Nelson seems super excited when his wife wakes up, but doesn't seem very concerned that the, that the daughter hasn't woken up yet. He's like, ah. Um, but that scene was long. Like we could have just, we get it. They're now out. We know nothing's going to happen to them in the long run. We understand that. And by the way, they've sent off their older daughter and their older son. Just so every, like they've, they're gone. Right. Staying with other people. Um, oh, they, I got it. I got to talk about that though. That yeah, freaking scene it. where the kid gets in the cab by himself, ha! that like eight year old kid and yeah. his dog get in the cab. And I just love how in every freaking movie, when someone has to get in a taxi to leave, it's, you're always standing up on the door on the porch, you know, like, yeah, why wouldn't they go down, get him in the tax? It's just like stuff like that just drives They're me crazy. Not, yeah, you think they'd be at the door and when the door was closing, they'd lean in through the window and like, right. Or why doesn't someone just drive him to grandma's house? Yeah, exactly. Why are, why are <laughs> both of you staying? Here? Like how far is grandma's <laughs> house? Like how far is it? Right. Cause if it's only 30 minutes, an hour round trip, you're just going to take him yourself. Yeah. Well, regardless, if it's far or close, don't send him with a stranger. Or it can't be that far, though, because he's in a cab. <laughs> just such a weird, like just a Captain weird. He's doing two, three hour detours down the 405 right. from L.A. to San Diego. Right. I, so you know that, I that, that really drove me crazy. I was screaming at at my TV when when that happened because it I just mean, doesn't make sense. He does have Ebuzz, his dog. So, and I don't know what the name Ebuzz is. I think Ebuzz, Spiel- Ebuzz. I think Spielberg made that up. That sounds like Spielberg was smoking a joint himself and came up with that name. But everybody's gone, and then now they've decided to. After all of this has gone down, everybody seems quote unquote, back to normal. And now they're moving. They're like, we're out of here. Rightfully so. It only took, you know, your daughter nearly being murdered by ghosts to, <laughs> to get out of the house. Well, we, real, real quick. It's just because just because it's a famous line, the exorcist, when when after she gets oh, yeah. saves him and she she gives that famous line, this house is clean. I thought that By was the way, pretty I cool. I love that scene because the, the cronies – filming her with a video camera and her hair is all messed up and she just i love that i love this i did love this scene because she looks right in the camera and kind of pretends to fix her hair yeah it's great she's like this house is clean with her voice that that weird mousy voice 
Yes. So that great. was it. That is a good scene. And of course, we can always that always reminds me of Ace Ventura. Yeah, which, me too. That's that's how I know that. <laughs> but after he's he's uh figured out uh yeah, what's who 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 did he figure out? I'm trying to remember now. Uh it was it was after when Roger Predactor. Roger, Roger Predactor. Yeah. And he <laughs> says, This house is clean. I have exercised the demons. Exercised the demons. <laughs> That's a great, a great movie too. Um, but yeah, they're getting ready to move now. The kids, by the way, this is where you get that line. They're putting everything in the moving van. The daughter, the older daughter is now back. She comes out and they're like, we're leaving tonight after everything's packed and we're going to go stay at the Holiday Inn on I-74. And this is where the daughter's like, oh, I know where that is. And the mom's like, what? And then she's like, nothing. You're like, okay. Just God, man. Like, let's not sexualize a 16-year-old, please. Well, here's the other thing. And maybe I'm poor. At the beginning, she's eating, like, pickles and, like, weird. Oh, my God. I didn't even think about that. Just saying. Spielberg, man. I got to have a word with him. Just saying. Like, if you think she's eating weird food that you would eat if you potentially were pregnant. Oh, my God, dude. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, Tarantino always has shots of feet. So, you know, everyone thinks that he's got a foot fetish. Maybe Spielberg, yeah. you know, we're going we're gonna to have to go through Spielberg's filmography and see if he's got some other references in there. Because to me, let's not sexualize a teenager, please. Yeah, please. I'm, I'm I mean, I, maybe it was more acceptable back in 82, but I don't think so. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't know. I you would think not but i would hope not you you never know 82 was we 80s were weird man they were weird my um, favorite decade as you know it's mine too but they were weird <laughs> so so dad's gonna quit his job he's gonna tell the developer we're out of here i'm not gonna take the job they're packing the van up they're leaving the mom also now has a white streak in her hair from the experience what'd you think about that Cool, I guess. I don't know, man. I, 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 I don't get the point of it, but yeah. But you know what she says to her daughter when her daughter says, "You gonna fix that?" Looks street? punk, right? <laughs> Super punk, middle aged mom. <laughs> I'd have to consult with you on that. Hey, man, I'm I'm a middle aged punk, on the, so on the punk authenticity. I, I guess I can't really be be knocking her for that. Um. <clears throat> You kind of, in, in some way, you know, you're an hour and a half in. You're an hour and 40 minutes in. So you almost think that the movie's over, to be honest. It no. felt like it. And I looked at the runtime. I, I didn't know how there were 20 minutes left. I, I kind of thought the same thing. I thought, well, this is it. Okay, that was. But then uh, we have to get one more plug-in of a Star Wars blaster. <laughs> Very important. The kids are in the bedroom ready to lay down. They're going to lay down. The dad's gone forever. I don't know why he's even left. Well, the the thing I didn't understand is he tells the wife, we are not sleeping here. No matter what, we are not sleeping here tonight. Yeah. And then they all get ready for bed. So I don't don't understand it. Well, he says if the kids just let them fall asleep and then we'll, you know. That's what he told her. He said, let him fall asleep. So I guess she was just letting him fall asleep. But uh, their room's basically empty. That's the other thing. They've loaded the, the van, but the damn clown is in the room still. <laughs> and you got to explain to me why, of all those things, the clown is still in that room. Because how are you going to get your big scare if you don't have the clown in the room? Oh, man. So they lay down. She tells him to go to bed. Then she goes, runs a tub, right? She's going to run a tub, do a little relaxation. She's got to dye her hair too. Yeah, she's going to dye her hair. The two kids lie down to go to sleep. And then what do you know? But that clown is positioned on a chair directly pointing at the son's bed. Yeah, it's not even like up on a shelf or something or tucked in the closet. It's sitting on a chair facing the kid but i will say once again that close-up of that clown is creepy super creepy and he gets up to uh go cover it again right he gets up to go cover it again and then what do you know uh 
he hears something. He lays down and then he hears something, a rumbling in the room. And then he pops it up and looks and boom, the chair's empty. And I just, th- this is a point in the movie where they they played it right with the music. They didn't have any music here. They it, played it right with not having music. Yeah. And also here's where Poltergeist the remake failed. So this scene, I liked this scene a lot. I thought it was really well done. I, I thought the crown was the clown was creepy. I thought the the suspense build of where it is, it's that traditional setup of we knew where it was. Now he's the subject, the character knows that it's not there. And we also don't know where it is, but we know it's not where it was. So it's that idea of kind of playing with the mindset and the psychology of like, where is this thing? And they play, I like the traditional setup. He's looking around, he's looking under the bed on one side, then the next side, right? And still no sign of the clown. And then all of a sudden uh, he's, he's like, He's, he's looking, he looks under the bed, right? Yeah, he looks on under the bed side, on both sides. Both sides. Then when he comes up on the second side, it wraps its arm around him. That was, to me, that was freaky. Yeah. I liked how they did it, that. It was, a, it was a good, they subverted your expectations. It was a good scare. It was quality. This also was like the scariest part of the movie in the sense of like true horror, where you get a little shock value on a scene where there's a little, it's that, it's that, it's that shock and awe, right? The, the quick, you knew it was going to happen and you knew what was there, but the way they cut it, when it wraps around and you see the kid's facial expression and like his arm stretches out and wraps around, like, I mean, it's, it's pretty. And you also, here's what you also hear. And I want to know what you think, because you do hear a cackling. Yeah, like that was, I liked that. I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, that's, this is the scariest uh, part of the entire movie is this clown sequence. Cause then he's getting pulled under the bed into some Netherlands or yeah, he's getting yeah. pulled into the bed. And I thought that was, and the mom's so oblivious brushing through her hair. Now <laughs> Carol Ann wakes up. Carol Ann's in shock because her brother's gone. It cuts to the mom in the bedroom, just relaxing. And then I thought this was cool too. What did you think about the scene with the mom in the bedroom? Uh, yeah, no, cool? that, I mean, that was very nightmare on Elm street. That's what I kept thinking about the whole time. I kept thinking, wow, I think Wes Craven pulled a little copy here. Oh, when did Nightmare come out? When was that? Uh, Nightmare's three years later. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know why I was thinking the Nightmare was before this. Yeah, totally. He totally did. He totally pulled it. He did it better, but. I think Wes Craven did it much better, but. I think he definitely he pulled the concept from this scene. Yeah, I I agree, hundred percent. I thought that this was pulled from Nightmare. Yeah, I'm, I was way off. Mom's getting dragged all around up on the ceiling along the wall. I loved it. I thought it was great. And then it's intercutting back. Now the closet door is open again, like it was before. The light shining through. Somehow Robbie has. Robbie's the kid. Somehow he's. Uh, he he got. Rid of, he, he, he escaped from the clown and the clown's no longer paranormal. It's, it's just, and not. him ripping up that clown is hilarious, but what does it, what does he do? Does he rip the head off or what does he it, do? it looks like he's just ripping all the stuffing out of it and oh, screaming it's... at it the whole time. Like, because he basically dismantles it. It's yeah. Gone. It's great. Like you could just feel that kid's rage that kid. And I will say this, the entire movie, his best performances are when he's being a little asshole. Yeah. I mean, you can tell. I don't know the kid. I don't want to disparage anyone. But I, I get real, like, real brat vibes from that kid. The real, he's really, he's real snide. That's my guess. Sno- snide. He's got those snide remarks. <laughs> those snide remarks. <laughs> Trying to so, beat up his sister. Uh, but they're, they're definitely experiencing something again. And the thing that she thought she had exercised the demons... She did not. She's not a very good exorcist. So as great as her character was, she's not very good at her job. Nope. Not at all. Um, this is the part where I laughed with Craig T. Nelson coming back. Because he does. This is another. This is another. Yeah. He gets well, out let's of say a... quickly, quickly. The mom's running outside in a panic because the door can't open because it's being 
protected by the beast. There's a skeleton right. thing uh, not allowing her to enter the bedroom where her kids are. And Carol Ann's freaking out. Robbie's trying to get out the door. Mom's running outside in the thunderstorm, falls in the pool with the skeletons popping up. And in the meantime, now we get a cut of dad pulling up and his he's trying to he's seeing light come from the windows and he knows that something's wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's the same stuff that was happening before. And he gets out of the car and he like walks so slowly up to the, the steps to bring him up to the house. And then he just stands there for a minute. And this is the part like I, I know what you're talking about earlier when he just kind of stands there at the top of the stairs. But this is the part that was really like, are you going to do something about this? Like, at what point are you going to run in charge after your family? Or are you just going to let him die? He's like, ah, I'll just let him go. Eh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> because mom's in a pool and it, where they were digging for the pool. There's skeletons in there. It's muddy. She can't get out. Coffins are popping up and Coffins are popping corpses up. are everywhere. And I thought this it, was cool. It was cool. But this is once again where I got confused because I thought it was Indian burial ground. But I think we've already established that, that it wasn't or it's not supposed to be. And coffins and skeletons are just popping up. It's muddy. It's very cool. I like that. It was very, uh, it, it had a lot of, it kind of had a little bit of, you know, it's to me, it had a little Indiana Jones to it. That's what I was thinking the whole time. Again, not scary. It's more Indiana Jones. And that's also when the guy was peeling his face off, that felt very Indiana Jones too. Yeah, it did. It did. Uh, Dad gets home. He's trying to figure out how to help out. The neighbor actually comes over and pulls the mom out of the pool. And then the mom runs back into the house. This was a cool shot, though, when she runs into the house and there's the hallway with the door lit up. Yeah. You know, this this was a either Toby Hooper as an homage to Spielberg or Spielberg just taking over saying, do this. Because this is a famous technique used by Spielberg in Jaws, which is the dolly zoom. Right. right. So you push in with the dolly and as you push in, you pull out on the zoom and it creates this elongated effect. I liked it. It looks cool in the movie, you know, with the lit door behind it and she keeps running and it's almost as though she can't get there because the hallway is stretching. And it is a very long hallway. <laughs> it's like, when did they move into an office building? <laughs> Uh, but the, the technique's cool. This is where I got, as she gets into the room and this is where I was thinking, is this stranger things? It just yeah. turned into stranger things. It, and I liked the effect of what was going on with the closet. And I, I don't even know how to describe it other than it looks like, it looks like the inside of a monster's throat or something. Like it looked super creepy and there's like this little rope coming out of it. And it almost looks like a monster's tongue. And it's trying to get the kids to suck them in. And it actually, and, and so, and it's got some kind of hell force winds that pull it inward. Oh yeah. Um, this is a very windy movie all the way the, around. The mom's holding onto the door frame. The kids are holding onto beds. They're getting sucked in and they're trying to prevent the wind from pulling them in to this. And it does look, have you seen stranger things? No, I haven't. I've seen, I've seen most of it, but I haven't, haven't finished it. The season three is like, okay, I see little homages to Poltergeist and Stranger Things. Sure. In terms of the, the last minute looks, like these, the looks of the, the creature and the beast, the paranormal thing in the closet has that very kind of upside down world vibe that Stranger Things has. But for 1982, I think the effects are fantastic. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, yeah. I mean, other than the digital stuff that just looks too Ghostbusters-y, I think overall they, they did a really good job with the effects. Yeah. And so they get out of the room. This is where it's funny though. This is what made me laugh is like they get, they finally get out. Like the mom pulls them out. They, they grab each other. Robbie grabs Carol Ann. Carol Ann gets pulled. They all get pulled out together and then they're running through the house. And the whole time, by the way, dad's outside, just coffins popping up everywhere. He can't get inside. He can't get inside. And then coffins start popping up in the kitchen what the kids are trying to get out and um this is the big reveal alan this is the big reveal because as dad can't get in and the family can't get out or they're trying to uh his boss pulls up 
And the dad yells at him, you only moved the headstones. You son of a bitch. You only moved the headstones. Like, it's so melodramatic. And then your favorite music gets cued in. And God, uh, they jump in a car and they just they leave. Uh, the older daughter arrives and she's like, what's happening? <laughs> that was a little funny to me. Like, OK, you have I'm not sure what you're doing in this movie, but. I was just going to say, I don't I don't think there's any point of having her in there. I get Robbie, of course, Carol Ann, but I don't understand older daughter. That's her name because she just goes off. She just leaves like they just let her leave with God knows who go stay with God knows who. And she's just gone for the entire movie. She pops up in for a line or two and then she's gone again. Right. Right. And then the house basically gets imploded into the ground, which was really cool because honestly, uh. Again, a very, very famous effect or very famous climax, I should say. And I've, I've seen it referenced and I, I wasn't sure how it was going to look uh, watching it now in 2020. And it actually looked really well, really good. I liked it. I thought they did yeah, a great job with it. I thought so, too. And it kind of just and the neighborhoods all out. Everyone's looking at what's happening. It gets it gets basically sucked into some kind of spectral light implodes it upon itself. And the family is now in a car and they're driving away. They're out of there for sure. They're not waiting for the moving van. Finally, after two hours, we figured out that we shouldn't be in this place. <laughs> and they leave Cuesta Verde. Cuesta Verde is the fictional town, I oh, guess. Oh God. It's uh, after two hours and, and however many days that their daughter was trapped in the astral plane. Like they finally now realize that they got to get out. They finally realize Holiday Inn is safer than their yeah, house. Exactly. <laughs> and so they, they're just, all, everyone's muddy and tuckered out. Everyone's just strolling through to the Holiday Inn. They open the door. This was, I, it was cheesy, but it was funny. The door closes on the Holiday Inn. Then it opens again. And the dad push, rolls out the TV cart, pushes the TV outside the room. Yeah. And then a, then you get a pull away shot with some instrumental music and uh, first things first, Steven Spielberg production. Yeah, they don't even they don't even accomplish poltergeist. Yeah, I, I love how how Spielberg is, is credited at the end as a producer. You know, like that's the first thing that pops up. Well, it's uh, yeah, Steven Spielberg production, <laughs> not directed, not by a or, film by to, to, by film Toby by. Hooper, not directed by Toby Hooper. Well, you're. You're not going to let that one go. No, man. It's, it's you know, like, it is what it is. It, it was a good collaboration between them. Um, it's it's just, it it is what it is. Well, we've gotten through it. We mustered our way through the movie. Uh, we got off on some good tangents there. Uh, I want to hear your summation and your rating. Okay. Um and any quiz that you, anything that you, if you have any trivia or quiz stuff. Okay. First of all, as I'm having a hard time because I am looking at this movie as a horror fan who was looking to watch a horror movie. As a film, it's very competent, very well done. It's a fun movie. Uh, I don't necessarily think horror should be fun most of the time. Uh, this feels more like an adventure or a fantasy uh, picture. It doesn't. It just doesn't feel scary. There are some scary elements, but I don't. I mean, it, it felt Beetlejuice, you know, like Ghostbusters. Like I've said, it, Adam's Family. Like it felt like the horror's there, but it's not really scary, and that's not really the main focus. Uh, I, I. But overall, it's good. I just. I'm having a really hard time divorcing myself from the notion that this should be a scary movie. I'm having a really hard time. So I guess, and this is totally not fair. I'll be the first to say it, but I'm going to, I'm going to critique it based on that because it's horror month. So I can do that. So I'm going to go with a 6.8 tennis balls. Six, but that's good. That's good. Okay. Alan question. Did you feel any of the following terror, fear, fright, alarm, panic, dread, trepidation no none of those none not not a single one um how about a feeling of no that's not gonna work are the is this the definition of horror 
a feeling of dread and anticipation that precedes the horrifying experience. Horror is the feeling of revulsion that usually follows a frightening sight, sound, or otherwise experience. No. Uh, I was a little surprised when the guy started peeling his face off, but I don't know if I'd, if I'd go that far. So you have 6.8 tennis balls. I do. And I actually do have one piece of trivia. Hit it. So when the kid, when that clown wraps his arm around the kid, that, I don't know what you call it, a prosthetic or whatever it was, that prop was actually strangling the kid in real life. And Steven wow. Spielberg had to pry it off of him, and he saved his life. What? Because I guess it had wrapped around him, and the kid was, was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And they thought, both Spielberg and Hooper thought that he was – ad living yeah acting and then but then when his face started to turn blue spielberg was like ah something's wrong here i'm gonna get this off this kid and saved his life oh my god yeah crazy well that would have led to the at the most horror that would have led to the most horrifying uh film experience ever yes but on a even another dark note, the uh, Heather uh, O'Rourke, who plays Carol Ann, after Poltergeist three died, and she was only thirteen years old. Oh, you're kidding me! So she passed. I don't know the extent of it, but I know that she did Poltergeist two and three, and then she passed on. Oh, it's horrible. So very, very tragic. But Drew Barrymore was considered for the role. Wasn't she busy on E.T.? <laughs> yeah, that's how she got E.T. Um, here's, here's an interesting thing that... Uh, let's pull this up. A couple, a couple reviews here from all the, the five-star reviews, Alan. Ready? Just okay. a couple little, a little tidbits here from okay. the five stars. Let's hear it. Uh, see if you agree or disagree. Uh, first scary movie I ever saw, and it is still imprinted in my memory. This is one of the best ghost horror movies. See, here's the thing. I think I can understand, and that's why I, I opened this up with saying I think nostalgia is carrying a pretty heavy load here because I can understand. If I saw this as a kid, it probably would have scared me, and I think I probably would have carried it for a very long time and remembered it in that fashion. Right. And I did see it as a kid, but it didn't, it must, I, maybe I didn't watch it well enough. I, I don't know. I don't know, but it didn't, didn't leave any impression on me. Another five star review from five months ago by a Google user. The characters in the movie felt real. The scares in the movie play on almost childlike fear. The monster in the closet, the tree outside your window, objects that move when you aren't looking, etc. I think that's pretty uh, accurate. I would agree with that. Uh it this almost I does. never actually thought of it that way. I've always been thinking about it from my 39-year-old perspective. But if you thought about it as an eight-year-old kid, you could see how it could be extremely scary. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And it kind of does, now that I hear that, it d kind of does feel like horror for kids. It does feel like, you know, almost made for kids. Right. Um, and I do agree with the characters felt real. That's what he's always good at. We already alluded to that. So we've done five stars up to this point. There's more to it. I'm just reading the first sentence. Sure. Three-star review from six days ago. Ooh. One good jump scare. The movie's decent, <laughs> but I think it's worth watching just so you've seen it. Hardcore horror fans will be disappointed. It's very cheesy with bad special effects. Three out of five. Peace. Nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. I could not. I may have written that. I may have uh, unknowingly written that in my sleep or something. You woke up and uh, <laughs> subconsciously jumped on Google. I, and you review it. I may have. Last one in contrast. Two more because they're funny. Five star. Three months ago. It's a pop culture icon and a masterpiece. A masterpiece. The score is outstanding and perfectly fit for the movie. <laughs> That I, I don't I, I do like this movie, but I do not agree with that. Yeah, I, I'm I'll, I, I'm gonna let that one slide. They don't know what they're talking about. Okay, I'll forgive last them. Last one, two star, one month ago, so freaking slow. <laughs> this movie needs. <laughs> this is actually funny. This movie needs a one and a half times to keep things moving along. Oh, fast forward one and a half times. 
So many dull scenes where nothing happens, drawn out conversations, total snooze fest, two out of five. I, I don't agree with that I, I at all. I don't think it's slow at all. I don't think it's slow either. Um, <laughs> three weeks ago, re- I, this one's funny too, so these are funny. You've got to be kidding. I resisted watching this for a while because I thought it might be too scary for me. What a disappointment. <laughs> It was more of a comedy than frightening, on par with Ghostbusters. Yep. Felt like Ghostbusters. Three out of five. Okay, so there you go. One interesting side bit here on the trivia. The film was originally given an R rating, but the film filmmakers protested successfully and got a PG rating. The PG-13 rating did not exist at the time. And that's what we were thinking is, I, I think it's more PG-13. I don't know how the filmmakers protested successfully. What does that I have mean? I've never heard of the MPAA revising a rating Not without budging. any cuts. Yes, that's what I mean. So Spielberg definitely runs Hollywood. He does, man. Because all it says is the film was originally given an R rating, and then it says, but the filmmakers protested successfully. Oh, our mistake, Sorry. You get a PG. So Spielberg's like, he's like, no. And they're like, oh, we're our bad. <laughs> Sorry, Steven. Sorry, Mr. Spielberg. Apologies. As you would expect, Spielberg hired Hooper after being impressed with his work on Chainsaw. And then this movie is nothing like Chainsaw. Like you hire a guy. Let's just pretend for a second that Toby Hooper actually directed this movie. You hire a guy because you like what he did with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then you make him make a movie that is nothing like that. Nothing like the the reason why you hired him. Right. Well, here's the last piece, and then I'll get into my rating from The Hollywood Reporter. You ready? Okay. Let's hear it. Open letter from Spielberg to Hooper in the week of the film's release. So let me get through it before you remark. Did you read this? No, I didn't. Spielberg to Hooper. In The Hollywood Reporter, a whole printed ad or a whole printed uh, quote or letter, I should say. Regrettably, some of the press has misunderstood the rather unique creative relationship which you and I shared throughout the making of Poltergeist. I enjoyed your openness in allowing me, as the writer and producer, a wide berth for creative involvement just as I know you were happy with the freedom you had to direct Poltergeist so wonderfully. Though, or sorry, through the screenplay, you accepted a vision of this very intense movie from the start, and as the director, you delivered the goods. You performed responsibly and professionally throughout, and I wish you great success on your next project. Spielberg. Wow. Well, Spielberg really loves his own direction, doesn't he? he? He's really patting himself on the back there. That one is pretty funny. When uh, I enjoyed your openness in allowing me as the writer and producer. <laughs> no. Wait, wait. No, a, a, wide, a wide berth of creative involvement. Oh, my God. And what so. was the line about? It was something like you were given a vision. <laughs> Like, it's just so, so. Through this screenplay, you accepted a vision. Oh, my God. It's just so funny. That is pretty funny, actually. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so let me ask you this one, and then I'll get into my rating. Despite being a horror thriller film, there are no murders or fatalities depicted in the film. Is this a prerequisite to a horror thriller? No. Do you have to have murders and fatalities? I don't think so. We always say, and they got their first murder. It, right, it's, right. It's, I mean, it it's it ramps up the stakes when there is a murder, but I think just the threat of of having death, I think, is all you need. I don't think you need anyone to die. Fair enough. So I'll get into mine. Uh, quick review. Uh, I think the movie's uh, successful. I think it's got. Uh, I think I do agree with you in the sense that it's definitely a Spielberg film in about 98% of what it is. Um, I also look on the flip side of that. I think it's absolutely impossible 
to direct the film and not have a little bit. That doesn't mean but the percentage literally is 98% to two. Totally. You know? Totally. I don't know where the two is, but I know it's in there somewhere. I really, I think we nailed it. I think it's in those real grotesque moments in the kitchen. And, and literally I can see it now it's 1981. They're on set and Hooper's like, give me more meat, give me more maggots, you know, trying to amp it up. Um, <laughs> So that might be his 2%. But I think as a film, uh, I was entertained mostly throughout. There were pieces that, that, that have aged just naturally. It happens with 40 years of time. Uh, but I liked, I think the biggest thing for me is the characters in this one. Uh, you know, usually that, that, that's also the case in a lot of horror films. Like the reason I like nightmares because Freddie's intriguing and Texas Chainsaw works so well because Leatherface is, mysterious and curious and there's things to them that appeal and i'm not so if, if i was looking at this compared to those like it doesn't hold up in the horror-esque nature of what the movie is i don't think it holds into those traditional horror films that we really put at the the highest peak of the genre i don't think it's that <clears throat> but i agree with you in the sense that i think as a movie it's good and it it holds uh an entertaining value as i watch it all the way through um, is it entirely rewatchable? Probably not. I don't know that I need to rewatch it again. Uh, if I saw it every, you know, I would break it down like this. Uh, there are films that I'll watch on a monthly basis. There are films that I'll watch on a yearly basis. This is a decade basis. I'll watch this movie <laughs> once every decade, right? That's a ringing so, endorsement right there. <laughs> that's where it, it doesn't mean it's not good, but because you also got to consider when we're giving these out, is that there's thousands and tens of thousands of movies. So is it a rewatchable monthly, yearly, you know, five years, 10 years? This is a decade rewatchable. Yeah, I, I, I'd say that's that make, I agree with that. I'm sure I will watch this again at some point with someone who hasn't seen it. Uh, and I won't be bummed about it. It's not like it's a bad movie. No. It's just not no, what I, I expected. Like, uh, ugh. I won't ugh it. Right. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, IMDb comes in at 7.3 out of 10. Oh, that's actually not that far off from where I was. Uh, and you were at 6.8, right? 6.8 tennis balls. Now the tomato meter on the critic side is 85. <coughs> so it's not as high as, I, I mean, when you think Spielberg, you're usually thinking probably nineties or above, mm -hmm. at least. but the tomato critics is 85%. On the audience side, it's 79%. And I think that to me is fair. I actually come in just below that. Um, and so my rating is going to come in at uh, a 7.1. Okay. 7.1. Um, 7.1 TV sets. Ooh, I thought you were going to go clowns. I like that though. I, I was... But because Poltergeist, the remake from 2015 was so bad and their whole emphasis, by the way, was the clown. It felt like that's what it was. OK, least. it they was really drove. I mean, it wasn't, but they really pushed the clown. And what I did like about this one is they they pushed it, but it wasn't the whole movie. Yeah. In a, yeah. So I'll go 7.1 TV sets for 1982 Poltergeist directed by Steven Spielberg. Yeah, my man, my man. I wasn't sure you were going to do it, but you did it. Uh, directed by, ghost directed by Steven Spielberg. <laughs> credit directed by Toby Hooper. It's so, Have you ever heard of this happening before? I'm sure it has. And I, I think I, Honestly, so. I wouldn't be surprised if Spielberg has done this before in other movies. I think that the other person that I would imagine doing something like this would be like Michael Bay. Yeah. Yeah, like he, he produced um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake that we did last week. Now, I don't know that he did it in that one, but I can imagine there. It, we talked about it. There is Michael Bay essence, too. You can see his fingerprints on it for sure. Uh, which which in a lot of ways isn't uncommon if your producer is going to have a little creative control. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I would say it's probably not uncommon. I bet it happens, you know. I'm sure it does. And like, like I said, I'm sure Spielberg has done it because I did hear people say he just can't help himself. It's not that he's trying to undermine 
Toby Hooper. It's not like he's trying to be a jerk. He just he just lives and breathes cinema, and he just can't help himself. He can't help himself. And look, there's no two different types of film. I mean, Poltergeist is a highly produced studio film with lots of money that box office tons of money. It costs like $10 million to make, which in 1982 was a lot of money or quote unquote, a lot of money. And then made like 160 million in the box office. So like it, you know, the thing that Spielberg does, despite whether you like the movies or not, is somehow, some way he appeals to mass audiences and universally he just rakes in the dough. Yeah. It's spectrum wise couldn't be different than Texas Chainsaw in this. I mean, it was successful too, but in a different, it's so different in, in tone and feel. Yeah, Texas Chainsaw was never meant, it was never supposed to be a hit. Yeah. Like, it's that's why the mob going, got all the money. <laughs> yeah. He didn't make it going, I'm going to walk out of here rich. Right. So. And where this was, you know, this is a film made to make money. It's a business film. Yeah. yeah for sure. So this is a 1982 Poltergeist, Tame Aperture podcast. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Be sure to check us out at tameaperture.com. Uh, look for previous episodes. Also join... Uh, give us suggestions on new episodes and uh, come back next week uh, for more horror month. This is Gabe and Alan signing. Oh, out. wait real quick. Can I say one oh, thing? Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I started a new Twitter account for us too. It's at tame aperture. So oh, sweet. give us a follow on that. Uh, I don't know how to build a Twitter account. So like, I don't know how to build it like interactions and stuff like that. So anyone out there, just give us a follow and throw us a bone. Cause yeah, I I'm, I'm admittedly not the greatest I can get through Facebook. So any suggestions you guys have? We'll we'll start throwing some tweets out. Yeah, I, I've thrown a couple out because maybe we can get suggestions. Yeah, for or, sure. Or or interaction. Yeah, I mean it's like my personal account has taken me ten years to even get interaction on it. Well. So yeah, exactly. So uh, I'd like to like to talk some movies with people. Yeah, check us out on Twitter. Also, and if you just go to the website, right, and it's going to have links to all those. I'll make sure the Twitter links on there as well. So. Uh, Tune in next week again for another horror podcast for the 2020 Horror Month. This is Gabe and Alan signing out. Tame Aperture, y'all. Take care. The Tame Aperture podcast is produced by Dutch Angle Pictures in association with Studio B Productions. Listen, watch, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube.